morning, Life Point Church, God is good. And all the time, and the sound of that rain sound good to you farmers and firemen, right? We know that what follows rain, life comes up. So we're thankful for the rain. We thank you for that sound, but most of all, we're thankful for the sound of God's voice in here today, amen. God is present. I believe he's gonna speak to us. Uh, everybody online, so glad that you're joining us. I believe God has a very specific word for, for us that are listening today because today's message is titled, titled God Has a Plan. Everybody say plan. God has a plan. And, and with the uncertainty of the future right now, especially with the election going on, we just need to be still and understand that God's in control and he has a plan. Right? I recently found myself trying to make some plans for some things, and God said, no need to make plans, he has a plan. And I said, okay, Lord, you have a plan, I get it. But have you noticed that? Have you noticed that God's plans, they require a lot of faith. They require a lot of faith. It's actually easier sometimes to make a decision without God because we can make it fast and we can make it how we wanna make it, how we think it should end, but I'm just telling you, that's a bad plan. Do not leave God out of your plans, amen? Because that'd be like, I wrote this down, I was just writing the message, it'd be like making cookies and leaving sugar out of the cookies and then tasting them and they're nasty and then blaming God, God, these cookies are nasty. When God is the main ingredient that makes things rise and taste right in our life. God has a plan for our future. He is the main ingredient. Proverbs 16, nine says this, the heart of man plans his way but the Lord establishes his steps. Aren't you glad that God's in control? God's in control. So who establishes our steps? We know that God establishes our steps. This verse encourages us to be reliant on God's voice, on God's wisdom, and God's uh, uh, understanding of the future and what he holds in his hand, right? Now remember the, uh, the pictures when you guys were little, uh, connect the dot pictures, and you didn't know what the picture was uh, until you got going. Now, I have a simple one here, and it doesn't take a lot of faith to figure out this is a cat. I'm just teasing. It doesn't take a lot of faith to figure out this is a car. And I believe spiritually this is what we all want when we're making plans. We want, God, I, I have faith, I trust you, but I want it to be easy. I want to see the picture. Because, you know, but here's the reality of what it really looks like a lot of times. Here's another picture, okay? Here's what the plans kind of look like. God gives us a couple numbers, right? And, and it's like God adds numbers each time, and we don't really know what this picture is. I do because I found it. It's a flower, okay? But you would not know that because that's kind of like our faith. It's easy to believe when we can connect the dots and we see the picture, but often God gives us part of something and then he gives us the wisdom and strength as we listen to his voice and we begin to connect the dots. The danger is this. We start connecting numbers and dots that are not his dots and we end up with a picture that is not what's in God's heart. Amen? But aren't you thankful, even if we've made a mess of a picture in our life of an issue or situation, God is still our redeemer. Everybody say redeem. He still can redeem that picture when you repent and surrender it back to him he can still take that messed up picture and make a beautiful portrait of what's in his heart in our lives. Aren't you thankful that's how God works? Amen? But we serve a God that connects the dots. Our job as his sons and daughters, as Pastor Kirsten was, was singing today and saying, our job is to respond as sons and daughters to their father's voice and follow his lead because you know that God's the leader. It's like playing a game of follow the leader. Remember a little kid, you had to follow the leader? We have to play that same game with God even though it's not a game, it's a reality. We follow the leader of God's voice in our life. Um, Hebrews 11, one talks about faith. It says this, now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Just like that picture. I didn't know what that picture was, but I have faith to believe that God is gonna let me connect the dots on his timing and it's gonna be beautiful. I wrote this down for faith. It's this, it says this, faith is the evidence that the spiritual realm needs for it to have permission, in a sense, to manifest in the physical realm. What does that mean? Faith is the secret ingredient. Right, because he doesn't sleep, right? He's never said, oh, wow, I didn't see that coming in Terry's life. I didn't see that coming in Tim's life. I didn't see that happening in Tongi and Kirsten, moving him to Oklahoma from Dallas. 
God is never shocked or surprised because he's always in control, amen? He's always in control. We serve a God that is always in control. Our disciples, remember we've been talking about discipleship along the way, is to follow God and help other people follow God, right? I wrote this down, Isaiah 55, eight, it says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are, my, or, nor are your ways my, uh, ways are my ways, says the Lord, if I can say it right, right? We know that God's, he thinks differently than us, doesn't he? Listen, we're limited with our understanding of what we can put together, right? We're limited. We have to trust God, who's the creator of the universe and creator of us, that he sees a bigger picture. When I was a principal, sometimes a teacher would come to me and they go, Terry, I need this, this, and this. They didn't understand if I gave them this, this, and this, other teachers are going to want this, this, and this, and we didn't have in the budget to give everybody everything. They thought only here, and I had to think the whole school, right? We think that way with ourselves sometimes with God, and God sees the whole picture, how it affects our spouses, how it affects our families, right? How it affects our towns, right? So God sees a big picture. He thinks differently. Did you know that God's a builder? Think about this. Who created the universe? Who created the the heavens and the earth and the the mountains and the ocean, beautiful. I love the ocean. He created the humans, beautiful, right? He created everything. He's a builder. I think it's safe to say that God loves to build beautiful things. Does God like to build ugly things? No, right? No. We also know that Jesus was a carpenter. You know the stories. He was raised as a carpenter's son. He was a carpenter. Carpenters like to do what? They like to build things, right? And then God tells us in Romans chapter 8, the spirit of God dwells in you. That means you have Christ in you, Christ in you. I will say this, you have the spirit of a builder living inside of you. What's, what's God want to do as a builder? He wants to build you up to glorify his name. Think about that, you have the spirit of a builder, a carpenter inside of you. That it's about building, he wants to build you up spiritually, not for just you, of course he, of course he wants to bless his, his kids. What good parent doesn't want to bless their kids? But his job is to build you up so you can glorify him so more people will want him. Be, remember, God wants all his family members back, the, the unsaved that don't know him, amen? But we serve a builder. Sometimes when we don't understand why something's happening, have you ever said, God, why? I think God has changed us to say, what? Would you ask the question, what? God, what are you doing in me, right? Because you're the builder in me. What are you doing in me? You're more concerned about changing me than you are getting me out of my circumstance. Now, maybe you've had an error in your life that the picture doesn't look very good right now. Anyone have a, anyone have a picture that isn't finished? You don't understand. It's maybe it's in a bad picture. It could be a job or relationship or something else. It just isn't a good picture. You know that God's a redeemer and he can make all things new. I believe God is speaking a word today that he takes things that aren't completed yet or things that maybe the enemy's been painting a bad picture, like this is how it's always gonna be in your life. And God said, no, 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 I've got the paintbrush and I make the decisions. I'm the author and the finisher, amen, of your life. Can I get an amen to God, amen? He's the author and finisher of every situation that we're going through in our lives because he's God. You know that it's God's promise to build up your strength and bless you? It's his promise to build you up and to bless you. Look at Psalms 29. The Lord will give strength to his people. That's us. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Everybody say peace. Peace. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. Everybody say shalom. That's a good word right there. Do you know that shalom translated means prosperity? It means health. It means rest. It means peace. If you break it down, there's like four different components to shalom. Shalom is actually the release. If if you know the Jewish culture, when they say shalom, they're actually praying for the kingdom of God to come. Remember, God says to the disciples, pray for the kingdom of God to come down on earth as it is in heaven. We know that there's peace and joy, happiness, strength. There's no sickness in heaven, amen? So God gives us permission to pray for the kingdom of God to come down in our lives. And when we say shalom, we're actually, that's a kingdom word. So you might start doing this in your family, explain it to your kids, parents, and talk about the significance of that kingdom word shalom. So when you say shalom before they go to school, you're praying for the peace and prosperity over their lives, amen, before they go to school, because school can be hard sometimes, right? But God's promise is for our peace. So if I say shalom over you, that means that your pastor wants you to have peace. So I say shalom over you guys this morning. Shalom is a release of God's kingdom. It's the reality, his reality of his kingdom. Sometimes our minds get trapped in the reality of what we can only see in front of us, amen? Like I can see this podium, 
But God, there's a spiritual realm that you can't see. That's where you walk in faith, trusting a good God. Just like when you got saved, you, you didn't understand how the blood of Jesus forgave all your sins. It did, right? And now you're secured in heaven in your relationship with God, okay? But you can have peace without knowing the future, right? When I played college football, when I went to my first college, I thought it was going to end out well. I thought it was going to be perfect. Man, they courted me. They wanted me. They made all these promises to me. I thought, man, it's going to be great when I go there and I'm going to go pro. I I thought I was going pro afterwards, okay? Um, But it didn't end that way. And as I began to work on this little part of the message, I I recalled when things went a little south, okay? Um, Tanya and I were, uh, got married at 18. Yeah. Um, I thought I was going to say 19, but uh, it cost me. Anyway, so 18, and we got married. Gary came right after we got married, and, you know, when you're young and married and you're broke and you don't understand things, you're learning how to live with each other, we do little things to bug each other, like Tanya, leave the seat up, and um, (laughs) pay for that one. But anyways, we, we didn't have it figured out. We were making a mess all the time. I'd come from college. She'd be stressed out. Well, Gary, we just didn't understand. And God began to speak to me. And he, he began to speak to me. He said, you need to find a church. We, weren't, we were raised in church, but we weren't really going to church at that time. We still had a Bibles, and we'd read them sometimes, but we weren't really living for God. And I had this thought. But I know it came from God. And it got a deep inside me. And it, it was this. If you can just find a, a church that Jesus is the focus, everything's going to be okay. And the church wasn't my savior, but there was a savior inside that church, amen? Do you know that the church is God's special bride? So when people say, I don't need to go to church to be saved, true, but you're also out of biblical alignment. God says not to forsake this coming together, right? Amen? Doesn't mean I don't go on vacation, we all have stuff, but I'm talking the church is important to God. And I just knew if I can, get, if I can find a church and we got plugged into a church even at 19 and people didn't give us much of a chance, uh, I'm, I'm serious, my friends didn't think we'd last, um, really because of me and my knuckleheadness. Um, but we got plugged into a church and we began to do life with other Christians. We didn't know anybody. You ever go to church and you don't know anybody, right? It can be a little scary sometimes, right? We didn't know anybody. We just got plugged in and we began to meet people. And check it out, man. And God began to touch our marriage. And even when we left, we left uh, California and we got into Edmond. I, Tanya, I talked, we're finding a church and we got plugged into a church we didn't miss. We never miss, and it wasn't a religious thing. It was a, it was a Jesus thing. We had to meet Jesus in his special place. We also have our relationship on our own with the Lord in our quiet time. I'm not surpassing, because that's the most important, but the church is when we come together. But I remember what, what changed the future was that moment, because as I began to meet with Jesus, and we go to church consistently, we begin to seek him and put him first in our life, I began to change. You know that when you encounter Jesus, he'll change you. As you begin to encounter Jesus, he's going to change you. Other people won't figure you out. They'll go, you're different. Almost, especially your party friends, they'll say, you're different, like it's a slam. When the reality, that's just the fruit of you spending time with Jesus, he begins to change you, amen? It's not a salvation issue, it's a surrendering issue. He's getting the Egypt out of you. He's getting the old man of slavery out of you. So I begin to talk differently. I begin to treat people differently. And it kind of affected me on the football field, okay? And I remember... uh, this is, this is crazy. This is a true story. We're playing Texas Tech, and one of the other players did something to me during the middle of the game, punched me or something out of the pile. And I remember I got up out of the pile and I said something to him, and it wasn't a Christian word, right? And I've been changed. I knew better. And he's walking away, and the Holy Spirit, man, got, me, got a hold of me. But I remember I was in the huddle, and the players knew me at this time as I, like I was the, the quarterback that prayed a lot. So the clock's going, 24, 23, you have so many seconds. And I'm praying, standing like this, praying for forgiveness for, for calling that dude a bad name. And the guys are paying, hurry up with the play. Hurry up with the play. So I'm not saying don't be a weird Christian because that was being weird. But the reality, I was still trying to figure out what it meant to follow Jesus. But it began to cost me a little bit, friends and stuff. And I remember it came to a point in Fullerton where the coach called me in his office. And he goes, um, we need to talk. And I said, what's up? And I was playing pretty good. And he goes, um, I need you to change. And I said, what do you mean change? He goes, I've noticed a change in you, but I need you to change back. And I said, like what? And he goes, I need you to be like a biker. And I said, what do you mean like a biker? He goes, I want you to cuss and I want you to be rough and I want you to take charge that way. No more of this nice guy stuff. And um, I was shocked and I just looked at him and says, I can't do that. I'm different. I can't do that. He benches me. 
And I remember that was the most painful thing because when you go through high school and if you've ever worked for a position on an athletic team and you've worked and you've worked and then all of a sudden you feel like the rug got pulled out under you, man, it hurt. And Tanya's never seen me cry, but I went home to our little bitty apartment in Orange County and I cried because I was broken. And at that point, remember the Bible says it's gonna cost you and a new awareness of what following Jesus might cost you. But what I thought was a bad picture, I thought that was a bad ending. Listen, here's the deal. If, if that coach heart didn't, I believe it was a heart thing, his heart didn't change towards me, right? I would have never looked to transfer. I was happy there. We liked Orange County, it's near family, right? But we wouldn't have transferred, but God took that brokenness and he had a plan. And God will take a broken situation in your life and he'll catapult you towards his destiny, right? His will for your life. Because if that didn't happen there, we would have never looked for colleges, we'd have never come to Oklahoma where the wind's blowing most of my hair off, okay, right? We wouldn't be here with you, right? I can connect the dots to that picture and see exactly why that happened there and how it's got me right here to be a pastor because I firmly believe if I wasn't, um, if that didn't happen there, I probably wouldn't be a pastor because I had other plans, right? I had other plans what I was gonna do with my life. God can take a messy situation, listen, I will say the word poopy, a poopy situation in your life, and it becomes a fertilizer for the new growth that he's going to do in your life. That's a word some of you need to understand that you've got something poop in your life. If you'll hand it to God, he'll turn it into fertilizer and new things will grow. He says he's doing a new thing, amen? Amen? But God is sovereign. That means he's in total control. He's a king. God uses even disappointments to turn around to be good in our life. You may be going through something that's disappointed in your life right now. God can turn it around. The issue is this, is will you stay, connect, stay connected to the one with the paintbrush that wants to complete your picture or will you take the paintbrush, because that's what we do as humans, we'll take the paintbrush out of God's hand spiritually and we'll begin to do what we want and God's saying, give, give me the paintbrush and leave it with me. You can trust him, right? You can trust him. God really will work all things out for your good. Right? If your situation is not good yet, it's going to get good. Amen? Romans 8.28 says this. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for his good. Everybody say all things. Sometimes the devil says, okay, you're saved, but you can have some good things, but you're going to be stuck with this bad habit. You're going to be stuck with this situation. God makes all things work out for your good, for those that, that love him. Now there's something powerful when you say it out loud, that's why when I say, I want you to say all things, but I'm trying to get you not just to respond to me because I need you, I'm trying to get you to declare it. I just want you and your families to understand the power of declaration. When you say scripture out loud, you're speaking the power of God over your situation. The devil doesn't have to listen to your thinking, right? But he has to obey your words. So when you speak it in faith, when you begin to pray things in faith over your family, over your jobs, over that coworker that just doesn't like you for whatever reason, and you begin to bless them out loud, uh, I'm telling you, listen, things shift spiritually. You can change an environment by speaking things out loud, but the devil does not have to obey your thinking. He can mess with your thinking. He likes to whisper like he did for Eve and back away and get Eve to think. Remember, she thought, well, maybe God's holding something back from us. He doesn't want us to be kind of like him. I'll take the fruit. So don't listen to the whispers, but speak out loud with authority, amen, to change your environment. What's going on in your life, right? Now, God says, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Now, the scripture says... Listen, what's God's commandments? That's, that's the word of God right here. Raise your hand if you love God. You love him. Okay, raise your hand, all right? If you recognize, listen, that I'm not perfect. I re, I'm not perfect. I get that. But you have, if, God says, if you love me, you'll follow his commandments to the best that you can. Amen? What does that mean? That means you can't be living in sin and doing whatever you want with no intention of changing and then expect a God to paint a beautiful picture in that situation. Are you with me? Do you understand? The there, there, Bible says we reap what we sow. So if you're sowing into a bad picture and you won't stop, God will get your attention. And it may not be the picture what was in his heart, but he had to take your messy thing and make it a beautiful picture because you got out of his will. So understand there's a holy and a reverent fear of God when we, we make decisions. We love him, but he says, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Now listen, I would say this too is... Uh, God is calling you to his purpose. That scripture says he's calling us to his purpose. That means he's got a, a purpose for you that's deep in his heart, 
right? God is way ahead of us. You know that God already knows the future. You guys know that, right? He already knows the future. He's never surprised. God wired me to be a pastor, but I didn't know that. I didn't know that he called me to be a pastor. Um, here's an example of God knowing the future. Well, uh, uh, about 10 year, uh, 12 years ago, a pastor in town said, I want to talk to you. God gave me a word for you. I was assistant superintendent. I go to his house and he says, hey, God gave me a word for you. And I said, what was that word? He goes, you're going to be a pastor. I thought he was crazy. Two years later, when the church started, and I thought I was going to help maybe be like a deacon or an elder, or whatever that looked like. And God says, you're the pastor. And I've already told you this, Terry, two years ago. A light bulb came on. God already knew the future and he put it in someone else's heart. That's a prophetic word. God can speak to you through his word, audibly through his voice. I'm also now, I've got my attention. If I'm talking to brother Jimmy, I'm not just having a casual conversation. I'm learning to listen because he may say something I've been praying about. He has no idea, but God uses his voice to speak to me in that moment. Amen. So I'm listening for God, not just when I'm reading the word. But God knows the real us. He reveals the real us as we submit to his lordship in our lives. You know, Lord means boss. And you say, Lord, you are Lord of my life. That means he's the boss. So I take every decision to him. Boss, boss, what do you want me to do? Amen. I take it to him. He's not really Lord if I make all the decisions about my future. But God knows the, the real us and he wants to reveal the real us to us as we walk with him. Jeremiah 1 5 says before, the, says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Did you see that? That God knew you before he formed you. You're already deep in God's heart before he formed you. That's why when we look at the uh, issue of um, abortion, do you know that abortion is murder? It made God's top 10. So I cannot side with the side that chooses murder. I mean, that's just the reality of my walk. Other Christians may think differently, but I just think that way. I'm telling you, but God knows us when we're, before we're even formed in the womb of a parent. And there's something deep in our identity of how he wants to use us. Listen, you can run from your true identity because I did for a while. We, I think we all have for a while. You can run from your identity, but God who wired you, who loves you, he's going to put these little bumper rails like in bowling alley. He's going to bump you back on the path. He'll get your attention of the direction that he wants you to go. When I went to college, uh, I, I wanted to be, um, I want to be a businessman. I, wanted, I had this mind. I was going to own three businesses that were going to be health food stores like I eat healthy now. Okay. I don't. Okay, but I, I was going to three, own three health food stores. I was in business, but then one summer we were broke and I needed money because my scholarship ended in the summer. And I, I, they had a thing uh, on the campus that you could work with these little kids during the day. And I said, I'll sign up. And I signed up for that. And I did it all summer long. And there were like fourth and fifth grade kids. And we did all kinds of different activities. It was like YMCA. Man, I fell in love with it. And I began to pray, Lord, what am I doing? What am I going to do? Because I love this. And he goes, you're going to become a teacher. I didn't know that. No one in my family is a teacher. God will use a moment to get your attention, and just like that will change the perspective and direction that he's taking you, right? I may not be teaching little kids anymore, but I'm teaching the word of God, amen? But it was in God's heart when he formed me. I didn't know that. I was going to own some businesses, but God got my attention, and I became a teacher. I heard a pastor say that since God already knows the future, that each day is kind of like a rerun to him. Don't know if that's theologically correct, but here's the reality of that statement for me is I don't have to worry about today because God's already seen it. My job is to follow where he leads, amen? It takes the pressure off me with each day because God's already seen that day. I just gotta stay in step and step with him. I don't wanna get too far behind God where I can't hear his voice and I don't wanna get in a hurry because I like, raise your hand if you like to make decisions, just be done with it and go to the next thing. That's how I'm wired, I like to make decisions, boom, boom, boom. Listen. You can get out ahead of God and God going, what are you doing? That's not where I'm leading you, amen? So I, it's step by step by hearing the Lord's voice, not getting too far ahead, but not dragging behind when he's already told you to move forward to something. Okay, if you're taking notes, I, I, you might want to write this down. I don't know if we, the screens are off. Okay, do not complete your picture. Oh, we do have it. Okay, God is the author and the finisher. Don't complete your picture. Your job, and it's hard to wait on the Lord, isn't it, when you want to do something, you want to make a decision. If you'll wait on the Lord, he'll complete a beautiful picture in your situation. And I think when we get to heaven, maybe God will give us a book, and in that book will be all these different chapters of our life. And maybe all these different chapters, because I like picture books, okay, all right, uh, that we'll see different pictures of what took place in our life, amen? 
but you do not complete the picture, let God do it. I would say this, God is not done with your picture. How does God know the future? He's already been there, right? Why are we afraid of the future sometimes when we know that we sing a song, good, good father, when we know the good father loves you and you're a son and daughter, that he's got the future plans already for you. So no need to fear about the future. Just like what's coming up here Tuesday, no need to fear that. You're a son and daughter. It doesn't matter the outcome because, listen, you serve Jesus. We're not voting in a Messiah. We already have a Messiah. Amen. And he's in control of all things. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, that he knows the plans. Yeah. Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. God's purpose is going to prevail. Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Listen, God's watching. Listen, God, God, do you see what's happening? Do you see what the people are saying or doing in my life or what's happening with this business deal? They're not paying me. I work. You ever, have, you ever done a job for somebody that didn't pay you? Right? God sees everything. He's going to make things right in our lives, right? That's why everything works out for saved people. It just does. Everything works out for saved people. It may not be perfect right now, but if you'll be patient, watch what God will do. Just like California to here, we love Oklahoma. We like to visit our family and friends out there, but we're not going nowhere unless God uproots us again. But we're submitted to him, and we love Oklahoma. We love the people of Oklahoma, all right? I would say if it's not good in your life, then it's not done. God is the finisher. He took the ashes from what took place in college. That was painful. I'm not, I'm gonna lie, it was a painful process for about six months. Even when we left there and moved here, I had a lot of hate in my heart towards that person that did that, that coach. Um, but God, I, I, I repented for holding on to unforgiveness because unforgiveness, I believe, is the number one killer in our life as a Christian. We'll hold on to unforgiveness, but it, the enemy uses it to hurt us. But I repented of that. I began to bless that coach, okay? But that was painful. There was residue, you know, when you have, when you burn a fire, there's ashes left from, there's evidence of the, there was wood there, now there's ashes, there's evidence. Well, I had evidence of pain, but I began to give that to God. When you give your pain to God, of, when you got burnt in the past, so if you'll give your pain to God, those are ashes. Look at the scripture here, Isaiah 61, 3. To give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Listen, God turns he, ashes into beauty. He needs ashes. Listen, he doesn't make beauty from nothing. He makes beauty from ashes. So if you have ashes, be encouraged because he takes those ashes and he makes something beautiful if you'll give them to God. Amen? Because that's what he does. God is in the process right now of making something beautiful in all of our lives. If you'll give him the ashes, if you'll trust him with the future, right? Remember, he's the God with the plan, and he has good plans. Jeremiah 29, they're good plans for you. If you'll love him by following his commandments and being who he's called you to be and seek him first, he's got a good plan for you. So let's pray. Father, we know that you have plans for us. We know that they're good plans. They're not plans to harm us but their plans for good. Father, you know the things in our lives that aren't good yet. Would you give us the discipline to be surrendered to give them to you, that we would learn the discipline of bringing all things to you through prayer and waiting for you to direct us. Father, Lord, the reality is, as you see way past today, you know the future. And we love you that you're a good father. We love you that you've always redeemed us and blessed us even when we've messed up. You call us back to be close to you. So we just give you glory and praise right now. We take a moment to pause and say that you are faithful. You're a faithful father that redeems us, that loves us, that has a plan. If you're here today and you hear me talking about Jesus, but you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, you've never surrendered to him, I just wanna give you an opportunity. I did that when I was in seventh grade. It's the best decision I ever made. If you want to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you've never asked him into your heart, just slip your hand up right now and say, yes, Pastor, I want to ask Jesus into my heart today. You've never done that. Anyone today? Anyone today? Father, you're holy and you're worthy. We thank you for your presence today. We thank you for the new thing that you're doing in us and our communities and in our nation, Lord. We trust you for you have a plan. 
takes all the worry off us, all the anxiety or fear, Lord, off us as we give you the future. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, in just a second, we're gonna stand back up and we, have, we close with a song and it's really one more opportunity to worship a good father. We have a prayer team up here. If you need prayer over anything, go ahead and make your way up. Let us pray with you tonight, today. Let's give God a clap of praise for his goodness. He is so good.